We are continuing on with our coverage of the massacre in Moscow, Russia yesterday. 133 people at least confirmed killed at this point. We continue to discuss this with our analysts and our experts to break down exactly what happened here. Joining us now, Hal Kempfer, our national security expert and retired Marine intelligence officer. As always, Hal, good to see you. Let's get straight into it. A lot to cover. Russia said on Saturday that it had arrested all four gunmen suspected of carrying out the shooting, which took place in a concert hall near Moscow. The militant Islamist group called the Islamic State claimed responsibility for Friday's rampage, specifically the Afghanistan affiliate of that group. But there were indications that Russia was pursuing a Ukrainian link in this case, despite emphatic denials from Ukraine officials that Kyiv had anything to do with it. Putin did not mention the Islamic State in his speech about the shooting. Uh, information is fluid, Hal, but from what you're gathering, is there anything out there to actually tie Ukraine to this attack? Uh, nothing at all, other than uh, the Kremlin immediately. In fact, as of yesterday, there were uh, folks in the Kremlin uh, close to Putin who were already starting to somehow say this looks like it's tied to Ukraine or something like that. This this goes against all the the tactics, techniques, procedures, strategy, everything that Ukraine would do. They would they would not do an attack like this. They've never done an attack like this. Uh, this is a, a clear act of terrorism. Plus, uh, U.S. and allied uh, intelligence agencies uh, just two weeks ago had warned Moscow that there would be an attack like this, or they thought there'd be an attack. They'd put out, we'd put out, our embassy had put out a public warning uh, to Americans uh, in Russia to stay away from concert halls and, and crowded venues. That's pretty specific when you consider the attack that just took place. So what, what Putin's trying to do is he's doing damage control at this point. Uh, he, he basically ignored the, uh, the intelligence warnings from the West, uh, you know, there is a, a duty to warn uh, when it comes to terrorist matters, even though relations between the U.S. and, and Russia are, are, are really at an all-time low, uh, we do warn uh, other countries, and they're supposed to warn us if there's a pending, they pick up intelligence on a pending warning, uh, a pending terrorist attack. So we did warn them. Uh, Putin, you know, typically just blew it off. And then you have this big attack. So now he's trying to pivot and trying to somehow make something of this. And so rhetorically, as he just made this big statement that, oh, they, they picked up the four suspects. There's another statement out there that said they have 11 people detained. It's not quite, quite clear what the 11 composes of. Uh, but uh, he says they were going to Ukraine. Uh, there was a window to get through the border in Ukraine. There were those in the Ukraine who were going to help them. So he's immediately turning this on to Ukraine. Uh, there isn't any free press in there to really disagree with this in, in Russia. So he's going to try and do this. And, and a lot of experts are watching very closely to see if he's going to try and use this as a justification for a big mobilization. You got to remember, this is just a day after uh, the Kremlin uh, had changed this rhetoric. You know, they've been calling this a special military operation uh, since it began uh, two, over two years ago. Just yesterday, they called it a war. They formally came out, called the action, and that's a pre-central rhetorical term. Yeah, and there was some chatter uh, about the possibility that, uh, you know, and, and you actually asked, you, you said something curious uh, there, that the U.S. and Russia kind of have uh, an unwritten agreement that they would share intel with each other. How common is it for foes like that to help each other out? It's actually it's an international it's worldwide. Um, we share it with all sorts of countries. Uh, you remember Iran was hit with uh, an ISIS attack. Um, I don't know if we picked up any intelligence on that, but we do have a duty to warn, and we'll tell governments whether are close allies or governments that are not very close allies, uh, uh, governments like uh, Moscow, who we have strong differences with. Uh, that's kind of something that's been really observed, especially since 9-11 is this duty to warn, and it's not just the U.S., other countries around the world uh, will warn countries of a, of a pending terrorist attack. Now, with that, that doesn't mean we give them everything. You know, we're going to protect sources and methods of how we acquired that intelligence, um, as would any other country protect their sources and methods as well. But it is a duty to warn, and uh, and Moscow is warned, and, and frankly, Putin 
disregard the warning at his own peril, and, and now you have the results of that. When we talk about a, a shooting spree of this nature, is this typical of the Islamic State? Is this a method that we're used to them using? Oh, it's absolutely in, in their kit bag. Uh, this is ISIS, and this is ISIS-K. Uh, this is Khorasan, which is a uh, something that kind of burbled up around 2014 as a, as a separate ISIS faction, if you want to call it that, uh, a group that was based in primarily Afghanistan. Uh, there was a number of uh, former Taliban and others who were rather uh, disaffected with the Taliban movement that formed up this ISIS-K movement. Uh, they have been uh, responsible for a number of attacks, to include the attack at the Afghan airport uh, when our when our they killed our, our troops as we were pulling uh, uh, pulling personnel pulling people out of uh, Afghanistan. That was an ISIS K attack. Uh, the other thing too is uh, uh, with ISIS K, I should mention that uh, they do these attacks where they use weapons, and in this case, they also mix in an, at least one or more incendiary. Uh, devices, so it's a combined complex attack, and and I have a feeling that that if we ever do find out what killed a lot of people, I think this goes back to that Russian ineptitude at emergency preparedness. You know, there's already reports coming out of people being trapped down stairwells next to what should have been an emergency exit and stuff. That just to me, I mean, it's possible they were shot as they were trying to escape. But I think more likely than not, we're going to find out that, you know, some of the emergency exits probably didn't work if they ever release that information. At this point, it's not like anybody independent is going to go in there and say, oh, this is what happened. You know, it's all the Russians reporting and the Russians are going to report what they want people to hear. But over the coming months, maybe years, we might get a little bit more information on what actually caused this. The shooting was part of it, but I think the incendiary attack and the fire probably was responsible for uh, quite a few deaths as well. Again. That's just going on their, you know, past history of how Russia does stuff. Uh, I can't, I, there, there's no independent way to verify uh, what was the actual main uh, source of, uh, you know, the, the killing, if you will, within the venue. Putin says he vows to punish those responsible. Uh, what does punishment in Russia look like and how might it differ from what we might be used to seeing in America? Well, Russia, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll put on trial. They've captured some some of these people alive. They're going to put on a trial. It'll be a big show trial. Um, there, there's there's nothing you know. There's and, and and frankly, you know, at this point, you can't even say for sure if the people that they've captured were actually people who were who were truly implicated. I mean, who were involved. Uh, it's just them. Now, <clears throat> there was a vehicle seen uh, uh, that matches, looks fairly close to the vehicle that was. Uh, reportedly tied to the uh, apprehension of these four individuals. So there is some credibility that it's possible that the four captured are actually those responsible for the attack. But they'll go into some sort of uh, judicial system and then uh, it's Russia. You know, uh, execution is very much on the table as far as the things they could do. Uh, sending them off to a, uh, you know, some sort of uh, Siberian prison, if you will, uh, which is probably just as bad as execution is definitely on the table as well. So there's a number of things that they can do. One thing you will not see, all right? Uh, I, I can't imagine any scenario where you would see, like you do with other prisoners. You know, we've had prisoner trades where they convict our people on trumped up charges, and then we exchange them for somebody we're holding that's Russian. Uh, there's nothing like that that can be done with ISIS-K. ISIS-K is a terrorist group. Uh, I, I cannot foresee any way that there would ever be a prisoner exchange with these individuals. And frankly, because of the heinous nature of their crimes, I can't see any way politically that, that Putin would ever uh, try to exchange them. So my guess is that they'll have a trial, and there's a very, very good chance they'll have an execution, uh, execute these prisoners afterwards. I want to expand on the idea of uh, U.S. and Russia swapping intel, uh, and I'll, I'll bring this tweet up. U.S. intelligence agencies gathered information in recent weeks that the Islamic State branch was planning an attack in Moscow. U.S. officials privately sharing the intelligence with Russian officials earlier this month, the U.S. officials said to Reuters. Uh, this makes it sound like Russia didn't act on a huge intelligence tip, as you've been discussing. But my question is, though, how common are threats of this nature, Hal? And, and how do states like Russia distinguish between what is credible and what isn't? 
Well, uh, you know, this was pretty, I mean, it was pretty credible. The, the decision not to make it credible was a decision Putin made. Uh, I think he didn't want to react to Western intelligence. In fact, I think he just basically dismissed it because it came from the West and because of the situation that Russia is right now with Ukraine and all the Western sanctions, he just dismissed it out of hand. <clears throat> that was at his own peril. And, uh, and, and it's not just that it was properly shared, it's that the, it coincided with a warning to Americans in Russia, which was specific to avoid concert venues and things. So there is, it's beyond the private warning, there is something we can point to and say, look, this was something we told our people at the same time. And, and remember, we were in Afghanistan for a very long time. We've been in the global war on terror since 9-11. So, uh, you know, we have a tremendous amount of intelligence uh, all over the world. We, have, we still probably have a tremendous amount of intelligence coming out of Afghanistan, despite our uh, our, our exit, if you will, uh, from that country. And, and therefore, he should have been taking it more seriously, but he did not. Now, this happens, uh, I don't, I'm not gonna say it happens all the time, but it happens regularly. Uh, intelligence uh, agencies, uh, uh, security services around the world uh, share intelligence uh, threats, warning, indications of warning on uh, possible terrorist actions uh, on a regular ongoing ongoing uh, time frame. So it's not uncommon at all. Countries get warnings all the time. We get warnings from other countries. So this is not something exceptional. Uh, this is something that happens all the time. It's rather unusual just because of uh, the situation between the U.S. and Russia regarding the war in Ukraine uh, that, you know, it's pretty tense right now. So it does seem rather odd that the U.S. would share intelligence with Russia to protect Russia when you consider all the things that Russia is doing in Ukraine. But terrorism is interesting. If you looked across the board today, uh, world leaders, uh, the European Union, uh, everyone, uh, the Secretary General of the U.N., uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, it's interesting that even though, let's just say most of them, most of them are not too thrilled with Russia and Putin per se, uh, they all came out and, and strongly condemned terrorism, strongly condemned these attacks and, uh, and showed uh, sympathy and condolences to the families uh, that had been impacted. And that is one thing, terrorism does unify the world uh, still. And the fight against terrorism is something that all countries share. All right, Hal, we'll leave it there for now. We're eagerly awaiting any more information to come out of Moscow. Take care.